In the interest of time, I'm not going to deal at all with the Soviet period or with uh, Dallas or New Orleans. I'm going to jump straight into the Mexico City story. That story, uh, I told a lot of it in my book, and there's uh, been a lot written about it since. Uh, the Lopez Report is almost wholly unredacted now and has a lot of detail about that trip. But essentially, Oswald traveled to Mexico City and failed to obtain visas for travel to Cuba and the Soviet Union. That's how the story begins. I'm going to show you some of the memoranda pertaining to that, to, to his visit and the phone calls. I'm going to begin here with a very interesting um, cable that really addresses the movements and travels of David Atlee Phillips, who from his personnel records apparently was promoted to, to GS-15 at this very time um, and promoted uh, at, not just to the grade of GS-15 but with duties as head of Cuban operations at about this time in September of 1963. Now even though the uh, visit of Oswald really uh, took place between say the 27th of September and on or about 3 October I believe returning, the cables to and from um, Mexico Station and headquarters take place on 8, or excuse me, 9 and, and 10 October. And I really wanted to know where Phillips was, uh, because I'm going to show you some, some interesting things about those communications. But this uh, cable here makes it clear that he was at headquarters um, at least after Oswald left. It's not, I'm not clear when he went to headquarters for Mexico. But uh, as you can see on this one here, he's scheduled to go down to JM Wave in Miami on the 7th and then to return, um, estimated time of return on the 9th of October to Mexico City. And the people that were interested in this, of course, were the Cuban Affairs people, SAS at headquarters, and the covert action element of Western Hemisphere 3. What we have here is, uh, and again, it's uh, thanks to the good work of the review board, a wholly unredacted uh, copy of the cable from Mexico City uh, to headquarters. Um, and uh, it's interesting here you have some marginalia that we had not seen before. The Mystery Man photograph, um, this was, that was a mistake. In other words, what we have here in the first paragraph is we have a phone call, a person using Oswald's name talking to Valery Vladimirovich Kostikov, and then we have the photo coverage uh, at approximately the same time this man walks in with this description. Turns out that that photograph was actually 2 October later on. In any event, uh, the only point I like to make about this uh, cable is that the station itself did not say that the man in the photograph was the man who made the telephone call. It simply reports the phone call, uh, the nature of the call, and that it, in their opinion at the time, which turned out to be wrong, we had this photo coverage of this individual walking in, and that's it. Very factual request uh, traces. What's interesting um, is what happens at headquarters once they receive this cable. And by the way, this is a new discovery. Uh, it wasn't in my book or anybody else's for that matter. Um, the headquarters response I'm going to discuss with you in, in, in a second. Um, this here, and, and many of you have had this experience in the archives when we run, run across a document that's barely readable, we have a tendency to either not look at it or maybe put it aside for later analysis. Well, it popped out less than a year ago, and uh, it appears to me to be an early response from headquarters, the one that we've never seen before. It's hard to read, but uh, it's really clear that um, this is 64 and a 3, and, and 6453 was actually the, the number on the, on the um, Mexico City cable. And this can only be a 5 or a 0, and uh, I think I've blown it up. Let me see if I made it a little better. Yeah. Uh, the 0 would have a slash mark through it, so it's probably not a 0, and you can just see the little tick going up for a 5. So it apparently is an early response, or a good possibility for an early response to the Mexico City cable. And it's interesting because it says, please do not share this information with something or other, perhaps the FBI, I don't know, the Mexicans, believe it's too sensitive and would be a little, perhaps, operational value. I'm not really clear what, what that is. 
But what's interesting about it is, if I'm right, that this is, in fact, a legitimate first response to Mexico City. Uh, the idea behind this is to whatever was, something was not to be shared uh, about uh, the phone call or the visit with someone. And I'll leave it at that for the time being. But there are, uh, I think the, the teaching point of this is that we, we need to still roll up our sleeves and get into the archives and, and hunt for this stuff because uh, it's still, there are things that uh, have yet to be discovered. In any event, okay, let's take a look at the headquarters response. There are two things they're going to have to do. They have to respond to this station. But in addition to that, because they've been sharing and, uh, information with or been receiving information on Oswald for four years with the State Department, the FBI, and the CIA, they're going to also have to notify those agencies. This is the uh, response to the station. It's ed I've selected out, it's, I've extracted the first and last paragraphs because paragraph two goes on for about a page and a half and it's about the life and times of Oswald in Mexico City. Uh, the pertinent uh, piece course is paragraph three and it's a lie. The headquarters uh, is telling their station that they've received absolutely no information on Oswald except for the last one being a State Department report dated May 62. Eighteen months. Oswald had not even returned to the United States in May 62. It hasn't returned until June. That would mean that all of the things that Oswald did in Dallas, in New Orleans, on radio, on television, and uh, and so on, uh, they had no idea. And you can see the people who are signed off on that. Uh, this is a very nice, uh, clear copy. This is Stefan Roll and the uh, counterintelligence branch of Soviet Russian Division, uh, Miss Jane Roman, the liaison officer um, over in the counterintelligence. And this should be an I, Special Investigations Group. That's Ann Edgeter in Angleton's Mole Hunting Unit. And of course, John Celso, who drafted alias for Mr. Witten. Uh, of course, that was not true. Um, headquarters was, in fact, receiving the reports during those 18 months, and the very people who per, uh, participated in the uh, coordination and dissemination of that cable were the ones who were reading those reports. As you can see here, this one here is the 610A, the cover sheet for the Hostie report on uh, Oswald's activities in, in Dallas. It came in on the 10th of September to headquarters CIA. And there's Jane Roman reading it, and Mr. Stephen Roll, SRCI, he's here reading it. And it's only a, a couple of weeks. This is uh, September the 9th. It's only a couple of weeks. Oswald's uh, just about to go down to Mexico. So it's not like it happened very far in the past, and they just forgot that they were reading all these cables. They were actually reading these, uh, these reports in the days leading up to this deception that they didn't know anything. And here's another one, even closer to the time. Uh, 24 September 63, this is the, the cover sheet for the De Bruis report, a very extensive report. Letterhead memorandum directed by FBI headquarters after Oswald had shown up in the television and newspapers. Uh, the uh, FBI headquarters directed a letterhead memorandum be prepared for dissemination, and uh, it's a lengthy report. And here it is coming into CIA on the 24th, and there you have Jane Roman reading it again, and I believe Ann Edgeter over here. It's interesting, uh, so it's not, uh, I mean, I think we've put to the lie, uh, to, the, to the idea that headquarters didn't have any information in those 18 months. It's really a question of why. Why would they say such a thing to their station? And uh, part of the clue, I think, is right here. The other people who are handling it, uh, you can see uh, two interesting, and if I can back up one. In the previous one, you'll see uh, an interesting uh, element here, CI Ops, an operations element over in counterintelligence. Uh, uh, a couple of days before Oswald actually arrives in Mexico, has this file. And then going forward on the next one, you will see, again, um, we have the counterintelligence element over in the Cuban Affairs staff uh, becomes involved in reading his files. And also notice uh, before I move on that in all these cases that uh, they've been diverted. They're not going into his 201 file. This is written in after the fact. The original uh, number is right here. This is where it was sent and that's an, uh, an FPCC file uh, as was this one uh, on 24 September sent to 100-311. Um, later on, I'm not clear exactly when, 
after the assassination, probably uh, this was lined out, and both of these reports were placed into his 201 file. This is the uh, corresponding cable to the rest of Washington, also written by Mr. S uh, John Witten, Celso, uh, whichever name you prefer. Uh, from the daytime groups on both of them, this one is, uh, goes out within two hours of the one that went to Mexico City. And uh, we've been over it a lot before. Uh, I'll just point out a couple of things. Here's where the actual linkage is made between the mystery man and the phone call. It's not done by the station, it's done by John Celso at headquarters. Reports the call, the time of the call, and then this uh, description of that guy in the photograph, uh, which is interesting because when he responded to the station, he uh, actually uh, used Oswald's true description when he responded to the station. Yet in the round robin cable, that he sent out at the same time, instead of putting Oswald's true description here, he links the mystery man to the Oswald in the phone call and puts in the incorrect description of Oswald's uh, physical characteristics. My interpretation of this right now, which is tentative, is I don't believe Witten really knew what he was doing. He might have, um, but it looks to me to be very, very sloppy. It's, uh, I don't see uh, th these kinds of mistakes is necessarily sinister. I, I, I noted with great interest uh, Bob Tannenbaum's presentation here uh, where he talked about, uh, for example, Lee Henry Oswald. Um, now this says, there it is, okay. Um, and, and my interpretation of that is, is that it's somewhat benign because if you were familiar with this 201 file, you'll see on the opening sheet of Oswald's 201 file, that is where the name Lee Henry Oswald appears. Now how that happens is another issue, but if John Witten had his 201 file open on his desk when he sent this reply, it might explain why Lee Henry Oswald is used here. I'm more interested in the fact that Kostikoff's name is missing from this. Okay, now Kostikoff is really somebody we want to talk about, but if you go back and look at the original station report to headquarters, you can see that it's in there. And uh, this would become uh, a bomb on 11-22-63. When the shots rang out in Dealey Plaza and Oswald's name comes over the radio, that name would, would uh, electrify the upper echelons of uh, Washington officials. And somehow, uh, by the time headquarters reports the story with all these errors in it, um, to the rest of, uh, of, of Show Washington, the Kostikoff link is missing. Uh, now that, not to worry, because when Scott, who was doing his job down in Mexico City, made sure on the 16th that he sent around the whole information of this story to everybody else down there, including the FBI man, Clark Anderson, who then, on the 18th, cabled FBI headquarters the story, along with the Kostikoff name in it. Uh, so it, it, it results in a uh, delay of about 10 days before the, uh, the name Kostikoff actually goes to FBI headquarters. But I think it's more significant that Kostikoff's name is not in here uh, than these other things because of a tendency I'm seeing in some of these uh, anomalies to lower Oswald's profile at this time. And certainly, uh, to remove the link to Kostikoff would do such a thing. Whether or not it's deliberate is something perhaps we can discuss or debate. It's interesting, though, that the day before the CIA cable on this story was sent to FBI headquarters, um, at FBI headquarters, the uh, flash status, the stop status on Oswald was removed the status he had enjoyed for four years since his threat in front of our consular officials on Halloween Day 1959 to give up his radar secrets to the Russians. And that alert had remained in effect all those years until just hours before the CIA was to send the story that Oswald was in Mexico over to FBI headquarters. Again, my interpretation of this or its significance, whether or not the person doing it really understood 
what he was doing. He was punished for this a few days, you know, right after the assassination by Hoover. It certainly uh, helps to lower Oswald's profile at a very critical time, days before the assassination. A couple more things before we get to the assassination. <clears throat> When Scott, of course, wanted a photograph of Oswald, this is the communication asking for it. Headquarters did, in fact, ask Navy a few days later, and the Navy never sent it. So a photograph was never sent down to Mexico City until after the assassination of Oswald. Although one could uh, observe, I suppose, that when Scott and his colleagues were smart enough to look at that description of Oswald and realize it wasn't the man in the photograph, but a photograph of Oswald would have helped. And once again, the failure to send that photograph, of course, is another one of the many things that, that reduces the ability of people to, to really make all the, the correct linkages at the time. Um, in fact, here's the request of the Navy to send the photograph. One more thing. Um, this is just another incoming report on Oswald. Of course, it's, it's after the trip. It comes in. It's another De Bruis uh, report from the FBI on the 25th. I just thought it would be interesting to see who was handling Oswald's files in those days in between Mexico City and headquarters. And once again, you see a CI element of the Special Affairs staff, the Cuban Affairs staff. And it looks like the name Horn is very clearly uh, in handwriting there. And, of course, uh, on the day of the assassination you have, or just before, it, it's not that clear, but that would be, looks to be SAS again right here. Um, and then, of course, the counterintelligence people, uh, this is Ann Edgeter, CI SIG, the mole hunting group again, um, on the day of the assassination. Now, I don't have time. Uh, but if I did, I would show you uh, an extraordinary uh, set of records that comprise the FBI Mexico office and what they were doing in between Oswald's visit and uh, the assassination. And unlike official Washington, which appeared to be asleep at the switch, the FBI station in Mexico City was very active. For one thing, the New Orleans office was later lateraling in all of the reports that I've been talking about here this morning. And they were beating the bushes for every communist, every leftist, the Cuban, Soviet person they could find asking for any information on Oswald. So there was an aggressive uh, uh, investigation going on in Mexico City at the time, which I think, uh, projecting forward into what I'm going to say, I think it, it, it makes credible what Wynne Scott and the others were saying afterwards, that they had actually known everything at the time, treated him as a dangerous person, and were actually trying to do something about it. Um, activities which were going to be covered up and, and, and denied by headquarters uh, later on, and I'll be getting to that soon. Uh, yeah, one more little artifact that I found interesting in the uh, interim in between the, the, the trip to Mexico and the assassination is this document here. Uh, it was in Oswald's 201 file, although the 201 file is not, the number isn't written, 289248 is not in here. It may have been deleted, I don't know, it doesn't look like it. But in any event, um, it is something that Wynne Scott sent to, um, um, and that Willard Curtis is in fact his cover name, uh, did send to uh, um, J.C. King, head of the Western Hemisphere Division, um, on the 25th of October. And of course, uh, it, it wouldn't have been uh, something uh, written in that form because something written could be sent via teletype. Uh, something you put in an envelope is something you don't write. And uh, it was also shared with Dick Helms, as you can see in the handwriting. Attachment was sent to the DDP by J.C. King. This is Chief Western Hemisphere Division on, looks to me to be 30 October. So something was sent in an envelope. Um, apparently pertaining to Oswald, maybe not, but it was put into his file uh, on that date. And uh, I know that may not be the most tantalizing thing to you, but I'm, I like these, to note these little things at this particular time, so I thought I'd share it with you this, today. Now, before I actually go into the moments and hours right after the assassination, I don't want to slow down when I get there, so I just wanted to go over with you who Kostikov was, and more importantly, who was he to the FBI and the CIA at the time. Of course, we know he was a visa official in uh, Mexico City, but of greater interest 
as what everybody was going to find out um, on the 23rd, uh, which is what they'd been doing the previous year and a half or so. Uh, we had turned somebody in the KGB by the name of um, Bryken, uh, who identified for us two uh, officers in the KGB's Department 13 wet operations. One was undercover as a translator in the UN in New York, and the other was in Mexico City, and his name was Valery Kostikov. And uh, so for, uh, uh, under a project called Tumbleweed, um, which was the case uh, involving this guy that was giving us the information, we had been watching Kostikov for a year and a half, as well as his relationship to KGB assassinations be a very sensitive case and a very, uh, like I said, explosive piece of information uh, to come out on 11-22-63. And you can see here, this is from Brennan to Sullivan on the 23rd. Here you have uh, the acting chief of SR division to Dick Helms on the 23rd about it. Um, here you have another uh, internal CIA one mentioning, you know, this, this history. Um, so there are, and this here is a, a, is a, a, um, a memo about a cable that came in from the chief of SR division who was in Europe at the time, still the next day on the 23rd, saying, you know, some of the details of, of Kostikov's K, uh, KGB and assassination connections. So uh, there was a proliferation, of course, of memoranda on this, this dark detail about who Kostikov was in the hours immediately after the assassination. Now, um, I have a couple of slides here. You've heard from a couple of the presenters at this conference about Katzenbach, and, and the Katzenbach memos have been discussed a couple of times. Uh, I want to do this in a little more detail for you here this afternoon. Um, and the, actually, the first artifact, I don't have it in here, I'm sorry I don't, is a Katzenbach memo actually on the afternoon of the assassination where he says if it turns out to be Oswald, we've got foreign policy complications. Um, I, be, but before I go into the Katzenbach memos um, and, and, and his meeting with Hoover on Sunday, I just want to do uh, a, an aside here with you. For this memo is very, very interesting, the first paragraph of it. Um, it's 4 p.m. on Sunday. It's Hoover uh, in a memo for record saying there's nothing further on the Oswald case except he's dead. Last night we received in our Dallas office um, a call from a man talking in a calm voice saying he was a member of a committee organized to kill Oswald. And then he goes on to say that they notified the police about it. The police had no problem and they did it again. They called the next morning, were reassured yet again and of course he says uh, there was no adequate protection. It's an interesting detail. Um, I don't know that this story is in, told in very many other documents. I'm not aware of them. It may be. Um, in any event, my, my, uh, my purpose in showing you this document is actually the following paragraph. I don't know if I've isolated it. No, I don't. So essentially what happened is that Hoover and Katzenbach had a meeting really to discuss, uh, and, and this is really the uh, sort of the beginning of the lone assassin um, story here and, and how it's going to be disseminated to the public. Um, the thing I'm concerned about, and so is Mr. Kotzenbach, is having something issued so we can convince the public that Oswald is the real assassin. That's an interesting thing to say on, on, on the 24th, uh, to be that certain uh, of it on the 24th of November. Um, and then there's a discussion, and actually a difference of opinion here on, on how this thing should be cobbled together. Kotzenbach wants a blue ribbon panel, and Hoover would, would prefer to just do it himself, I think, is what the essence of this is here. Uh, of course, um, Hoover is going to lose that argument, and the next day, based upon the meeting, uh, Mr. Kotzenbach drafted up this memorandum, which you've seen or at least had parts of it read to you, uh, I believe, by uh, Gary Cornwall yesterday, but I'm going to read it again. I think it's a, an extraordinary piece of, piece of work. It's being sent to Mr. Moyers, but it, uh, who was the top aide, of course, to Lyndon Johnson. But this was to be the story. This is what we would see a year later 
uh, when the Warren report was, was published. The public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he didn't have any Confederates, and that the evidence would have convicted him at trial. And by the way, any speculation about his motives has to be cut off, including any thought that it was a communist conspiracy or a right-wing one dressed up to look like one. And the next day, he sent some instructions, uh, Katzenbach did, uh, in a phone call to the FBI on how they would have to be dealing with the facts. He said, you know, we're going to have to use some, you're going to have to use some so-called editorial interpretation in pre preparation of the report. What do you think editorial interpretation means? A few days later, uh, the president um, used this story from Mexico City to pressure, to force the Chief Justice of the United States and other august leaders like Senator Russell into forming this blue ribbon panel. Um, Russell simply refused and said he didn't like Earl Warren and Johnson here tells him, look, too bad, it's too late, I've already announced it, you can work with anybody uh, for the good of your country and besides, you've, we've got to uh, you know, this link to Khrushchev and Castro will kick us into a war that will kill 40 million Americans in an hour. What link to Castro and the Kremlin? That's, that's Kostikov and the Cuban consulate. It's, it's, it's the Mexico City story. That's what it is. And Russell gives in. He caves in. And in the same conversation we learn how he did it with Earl Warren. Earl Warren had turned down Archibald Cox and Bobby Kennedy twice and then as Johnson says here in the phone conversation to, to Russell he ordered the Chief Justice down to the White House and there, there Warren twice refused him said no and then Johnson says and I just pulled out what Hoover told me about a little incident in Mexico City and he told him about the link to Khrushchev and all that and he said he had Warren in tears Warren started crying and caved in. Earl Warren himself backs up this story, except for the tears. Uh, this is a um, Star News uh, newspaper report. In 1972, Earl Warren appeared in a public television documentary, told the same story, how he'd been called down to the White House how the president had told him that the uh, link to um, Khrushchev would lead to uh, Castro and Khrushchev would lead, would lead to a nuclear war and then how when confronted with that that story Earl Warren said well Mr. President in your opinion it's that bad my personal views surely don't count and he caved in So in essence, the idea uh, that we're going to have, uh, that Oswald has to be shown as the assassin without any Confederates, that the evidence was so strong that it would convict him, and the way that, the, that this story would be put together, the structure of the commission, all that was driven by this story from Mexico City, and the president used it. Now. I want to focus a little bit on uh, the consequences of that story for what was in the record at the time. And just why and whose equities were on the table on 1123. Certainly they were at CIA. This is an interesting, uh, this is an extract from the summary report written on the 13th of December, an internal CIA memo about the first hours after the assassination, the minutes and hours. And you can see here, um, they did at CIA what the rest of us did that day, turned on their radio, uh, radios and televisions everywhere. And inside the CIA, uh, they put on their transistor radios. And as soon as the, the, the name Oswald was heard at CIA, and they weren't on LSD, 
Never the effect, the, the, nevertheless, the effect was electric. Now, a couple of things, um, a couple of false stories were put in place. Um, uh, two of them, in, in fact. One, that the tapes had been erased, and I'm going to deal with that second. The tapes of the phone calls. But also that headquarters CIA and its station in Mexico City had not known that Oswald had been in the Cuban consulate until after Kennedy was assassinated and then they checked into the records and then they made the discovery. And this is the document in which, uh, one of the documents in which that story is told. What I don't have for you here um, are the testimony given to the HSCA by various personnel uh, at the Mexico City Station. Um, they all say this is wrong, that those that were involved in the Cuban Affairs section especially, that uh, they did inform uh, headquarters of Oswald's contacts with um, the Cuban consulate. Um, what I do have for you, though, is some, some interesting uh, examples of where others uh, back that story up. And this one here happens to be Dick Helms talking to Lee Rankin, a uh, memo about that. In spring of 64, he says very clearly that it was the combination of Oswald's visit to both the Cuban and Soviet missions that caused the station to report it in the first place. And then we have George Kolaris writing a memorandum to the HSCA in 1975. And he very clearly states also that there were cables in October of 1963 which discussed Oswald's visits to the Cuban consulate. This is Wynne Scott's um, memoir, Falfo, and he's indignant. He mocks this conclusion, cite, cites the report, the page, of, page number in the Warren report that actually says so, that they didn't know and says, of course, we, re we reported every piece of information on Oswald, including his contacts with the Cuban embassies by memorandum to, uh, and cable, by memorandum uh, to, to headquarters. So this is from the same section um, of foul foe, because we thought at first that Lee Harvey Oswald might be a dangerous potential defector from the USA to the Soviet Union. He was of great interest to us, so we kept a special watch on him and his activities. It's a fascinating account, um, one which is in complete contradiction, of course, the idea that nobody knew anything about uh, his visits to the Cuban consulate. Uh, but he's not alone. As I said, the rest of the people uh, who were involved at the station back him up at the time. So we have the, this, you know, this divergence, and I think it's, it, uh, my, my interpretation of this is that this is a cover story. And when I showed these documents to Helms in 1995, uh, he agreed. It was pretty obvious that they'd known, and, and he opined at the time that it was basically to, to protect sources and methods. Uh, that may be true. That may be true. Uh, or partly true. In other words, uh, they had, we had sensitive sources. We had Alburu and others uh, in the Cuban consulate who were agents for us. And, uh, but it, it did more than that. It, this cover story, this, this idea that we didn't know anything about it, um, helps, I think, cover the failure of the agency to take measures, uh, sharing this information, uh, what they knew about Oswald and his Cuban connections with their station and with the FBI at the time. Measures which might have helped increase his profile and save President Kennedy's life. So there's more than sources and methods here that is being protected in my opinion. How am I doing for time? Okay. I'm going to move on to the tapes, easily one of the most arcane uh, elements of this case. Uh, and the story begins appropriately enough uh, with this conversation at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday between the President and J. Edgar Hoover. And it's always been of interest to me how Johnson knew to ask the question uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, what's, what's the news on the visit to the Soviet Embassy in Mexico City in September? So at some point, 
uh, Johnson had found out and is now following up with Hoover on it. Uh, essentially, the, by the way, the context for these comments, if you look at this, uh, uh, the larger uh, transcript here, the call is, is Hoover's is telling him, you know, we've got the guy, we've got the gun, everything seems to be in hand. And then Johnson asks this question. Have you established any more about the visit to the Soviet embassy in September? No, that's one angle that's very confusing for this reason. We have up here the tape and the photograph of the man who was at the Soviet embassy using Oswald's name. The picture and the tape do not correspond to this man's voice. It appears there's a second person who's at the Soviet embassy down. In other words, at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, the director of the FBI told the President of the United States that Oswald had been impersonated in Mexico City in phone calls gets better uh, around noon, a few minutes later, Hoover writes this memorandum to uh, Rowley, head of the Secret Service, Chief Rowley, and refers specifically to the 1 October call, this is on Tuesday, says here that agents of the FBI in Dallas who are talking to Oswald are listening to this recording and it's not his voice. But we're not done. About the same time, uh, and the uh, Lopez and Hardway figured that this memo was related to or based upon a phone call and we don't have a record of that phone call from Shanklin uh, to Belmont uh, that preceded it. I don't know if they're correct or not but in any event we do have the we do have the memorandum uh, and again it's not Oswald's voice on a tape but what's different between this one and the previous one this can't be the one October call because this call as you can see here, originates from the Cuban embassy. That's the Saturday call. So we've got two tapes, not one. And it's not Oswald's voice. Now, uh, as I said, the CIA erected a story that said all the tapes had been erased. And I'm going to take you through the record and show you what the evidence is for that. Um, but I want to put the matter to rest uh, again this here is from that uh, mid-December internal review of the moments at, right after the assassination. And you can see here, as it says, once Oswald was identified as the prime suspect, the written telephone transcripts and his files covering uh, for the Soviet Union were, were reviewed. The actual tapes were also reviewed. Many had been erased, but not all. The actual tapes were also reviewed. Um, that's really out of order here. I need to do, go to that one. Okay. The, in, in, in the extant record, uh, there, are only, there are very few uh, intrusions uh, into that record that actually discuss erasure, remarkably little. And this is the first one. It occurs around, uh, I guess, about 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday. And it's ostensibly written by Ann Goodpaster, the Mexico station. I say ostensibly because uh, I have some question now about her role in this, and she may not have done this, and she might have. It. But in any event, the, the line in question is, is right here. Station unable to compare voices, first tape erase prior to second call. And when the CIA did its analysis in the internal review, they made this, put this in plainer English. But what, what, what she's saying, or what the person who's writing this cable, or altering this cable, whatever's going on here, they're saying that the Saturday call from the Cuban consulate, well, the tape of that was erased prior to the next Tuesday when the 1 October call was made. And that because that had happened, there, there was no voice comparison done at the time. Which is interesting because when Ann Goodpasture was actually reading a Washington Post article a year later, which was saying that uh, the CIA had withheld information on the Cuban consulate visits from the Warren Commission and from its station. She took her pen out and put this sort of slash mark here on the, on the newspaper and then she scribbled this, which says that there was a voice comparison made at the time. Basically, uh, the, the caller from the uh, embassy hadn't been identified immediately, but once they received headquarters trace, in other words, once they got the response from, from headquarters, then Finglass did the voice comparison. And she's backed up by Dick Helms. Oh, by the way, before I go to him, let's just look at this. This is her uh, very recent sworn testimony to the review board, where she says the tapes were kept for two weeks not four days. 
And there are many other uh, places in the record where you can find the two-week erasure period. That, that no tape would be erased in, in three or four days, my goodness, the, the station wouldn't have time to, to process the intelligence and exploit it if they were erasing tapes in three or four days. So what I'm saying is I find this, this uh, cable here, uh, I, I doubt very much the veracity of that sentence there, that, uh, that in fact there was no voice comparison made and, the, and that uh, tape had been erased within four days. And she is backed up by Dick Helms, who uh, noted that there were voice comparisons made, where is it here, uh, at the time. And he's telling Hoover that on the 25th. Why? Who cares about voice comparisons? I'll tell you why. Because we have the other cover story. Remember, we did not know he was in the Cuban consulate. So if you're comparing voices between a guy using Oswald's name on Tuesday and somebody calling from the Cuban consulate on Saturday, you've got him inside the Cuban consulate. So the cover story goes poof. That's the issue. That's what's on the line here. You've got to make the voice comparisons go away. Yeah. Right. Right. Right now, I don't, you know, you, we, we can do a lot of things with this memo, Gary. Right now, I'm just driving like a freight train. I'm, the only thing I'm really concerned in, in establishing is there was a voice comparison at the time. We've got to make that go away. And then, but it can't go away, really, because it was done. And there are, other, uh, there are other memoranda I could show you, but it would, you know, it would take another four or five minutes. And so I thought it was, Dick, Dick Helms is good enough here. And, and then good pastor herself, her handwriting, I think, can establish that. Um, there is this, too. I'll, I'll just throw it up here. I think I'm doing okay for time. Um, this was another cable. Um, in fact, the one at, uh, 7024, 7023 is the one we just read, where she said there was an uh, erasure of one tape. And it says here, and this is, of course, at the time. This is Saturday afternoon. And uh, she says that this is Finglass again. That's actually Mr. Tarasoff. Um, Oh no, let me see. I reach out. No, this is not that one. That's the next one. In fact, if some, since I'm talking to you about it, let me go to 7025. Here it is. Uh, Mr. Tarasov says Oswald is identical with the one speaking broken Russian who called from the Cuban embassy in 28th century to the Soviet embassy. Um, while it's possible that this could be an analytic conclusion, I don't know how you can say it's identical without listening to a, a tape myself. That's my own opinion of this. Um, so it, it appears that Finglass either did a voice transcription, I mean, excuse me, a, uh, a, a voice comparison right there on, on Saturday or Friday, or at the very least, we, and this is probably uh, what is true, he did it at the time, back uh, in, in October. Um, so this is clearly, uh, I think, just one, one more piece. Anyway, moving along. Later on Saturday afternoon, uh, Mexi 7024, it's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Here the station says, okay, we're going to recheck all the tapes. So the clock starts running on, on a check for, for uh, looking at, for, for any unerased tapes at 3 o'clock on Saturday. And here's the result. It's another 24 hours. It's, it's approximately, it's a few, a few minutes, uh, 23 minutes before three on Sunday afternoon when the station apparently, I say apparently because I'm not so sure now I, I know what we're looking at here, but in any event apparently says on at that time that uh, all the tapes had been erased. Well, For that to work, the FBI is going to have to cooperate <laughs> because the, the story of the impersonation there had spread uh, pretty far by uh, a bunch of memoranda. Uh, let's start, I'm gonna, I, I've had this little horse, I'm going to jump around so I get them in the right order for you. This is the first uh, indication in FBI files that the CI had said all the tapes were erased. And it's the Eldon Rudd memo that goes 
I'm going to say goes with me. It's not really clear when he types it. The date on it is the 23rd. The providence of this thing is, is very interesting, though, because, you know, it's got the photos of the mystery man in it. And, you know, believed to be Oswald. So, if, and he is in Dallas. He's flown up on the, on the plane overnight on the Navy attache plane. And Clark, An and Clark Anderson had, se had sent uh, Rudd with, with this information. And so it would appear at the time he wrote this memo, he didn't realize that the man in the photographs, you know, wasn't Oswald yet. But he's there in Dallas. So it, it appears to me that this memo was typed up early, i.e. before they had the little eureka experience of looking at the photographs and saying it's not him. Um, it seems inconsistent to me that, that this memo would have been drafted uh, Saturday night after they'd looked at the photographs and, and he still says that the man in the photographs is believed to be Oswald. So that, that big paragraph here is, is interesting because it helps me establish the time or the frame of reference, the perspective that Rudd had was early in the day. The plane actually arrived at 347 uh, Eastern Standard Time. It was a little before 4 in the morning. And so, uh, but in any event, uh, the pertinent passage is here, right at the end. It's, it's the last part here. It says, with regard to the tapes, uh, they've all been erased. Uh, and the tapes referred to herein, but the funny thing is, there are no tapes referred to herein when you actually read this thing. Furthermore, there aren't phone calls referred to, and there's a phone call referred to herein. There's one call and no tapes. But it might say, with regard to the tapes of the phone call in here, so we really don't know, but at least this shouldn't be plural. Anyway, that's not the worst, that's not the main problem. The main problem with this thing is that this is early on Saturday. The FBI is saying that the CIA is advised that all the tapes were erased, but the CIA doesn't advise its own headquarters of this until late Sunday. It's too early. It's sloppy coordination of a cover story, in my opinion. And the next uh, item in, is this one here, although I don't have the teletype. This here is uh, from the Lopez report, and it's a reference to a teletype. It's in the evening of Saturday, and it's a Shanklin call to headquarters saying that at least one tape here had been erased. Well, the, the story of the erasure certainly hadn't reached or convinced this office at the FBI headquarters as late as Monday, which is still asking its FBI component to send the tapes to headquarters, along with tapes that were provided to Dallas, if you if you got them back yet. Right here. Why? Because uh, we, you know, the, the issue is the Soviet direction of the assassination, and those tapes are crucial. If it's not Oswald's voice. Not only do you have an impersonation, but it would, it would certainly undercut that hypothesis. In any event, uh, Clark Anderson put the, closed the door on that later that night saying the CIA said the tapes were erased. And that, with that, the story uh, was finished. Now Hoover was not amused. I mean, he told the president, wrote memos, uh, and now all that's got to go away. They look like a bunch of bumbling fools talking about having tapes and people listening to tapes and there were never any tapes to listen to. In any event, this is a couple of weeks later. Um, it's an interesting memo for those of you uh, who, who like to study these things. It's actually about illegal operations of the agency, domestic operations. And uh, Hoover's subordinates are, are sending him a memorandum saying, hey, it's okay, boss, they, they, they promised they're going to tell us everything. And he, he pulls out his, his pen in the, with this thick, characteristic Hoover ugly writing. Okay, but I hope you're not being taken in. I can't forget CI withholding the French espionage actions in the United States, nor the false story about Oswald's trip to Mexico City, only to mention two of their instances of double dealing. Now, uh, 
The person in CIA who knew most about the tapes, of course, was Ann Goodpasture. She's the one that handled them um, in the station. And I thought I'd show you just a couple of uh, portions of her recent uh, sworn testimony to the, to the records board. And what's interesting about this transcript here, this part portion, of course, this extract, is that we made a copy at the tap center. So in addition to the original reel, we now also have a copy of that reel. And it was not from the original tape, but it was from the copy that the transcript was actually made. Furthermore, she's the one who brought it in to headquarters and she says here, she tells Jeremy Gunn, I'm sure they would have sent it to Washington. It's just interesting to look at her handwriting, you know, on that Washington Post article and look at her testimony. It, it, it seems to me she's genuinely telling the truth. And I now uh, wonder, have, I have serious questions uh, about the record and that Sprague might have been right. He held, uh, shortly before he uh, resigned, as you know, I think it was uh, March of 77, there was that extraordinary press conference he held. Ron Kessler wrote an article about it and, um, where Sprague uh, said they had evidence that some of these cables had been changed and doctored. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now, I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, it's by any means proven, but those, uh, they're odd, they're odd. Uh, first tape erased prior to receipt, second call, and, and, and the Rudd memo, the way that thing's tacked on at the end. I'm now having, beginning to, to have serious doubts about the integrity of the record itself. Anyway, uh, I thought I would just add this, because I remember the first experts conference that we had at the review board and Mr. Slauson was sitting across the table from me and I don't know if it was Anna Nelson or who, one of the, re one of the uh, review board members themselves asked him directly, Mr. Slauson, did you listen to the tapes? And I'll never forget, I, I, I saw him fold his arms, sit back and, and say, I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to discuss that. And uh, then I, it was probably Judge Thunheim. Somebody else said they tried to explain to Mr. Slauson what the authority of the review board was in, in these matters, and he repeated himself again. Well, anyway, before it was all over, um, I, I guess they had prevailed upon him to speak, and, and speak he did, as, as did Mr. Coleman, apparently, if you can believe what Jeremy Gunn says here. He said, I spoke with both of them. And they said they heard the tape after the assassination, obviously. There was one other item in connection with that uh, that's worth showing you. Yeah, here, this one. It's out of order here. I have to go back to it. Uh, again, this is a part of that. Uh, it's about a seven or eight page. I forget how, exactly how many pages that internal mid-December review. And um, there was a portion of it to the review board, even to this day, and you saw from uh, Judge Thunheim how very careful they were not to keep things withheld. He, they really did go, uh, I think, as far as they could uh, in, in disclosing absolutely everything. Well, here they decided that whatever was in this particular passage had to remain protected. But they used substitute language. They wanted to make sure that we, the research community, got access to the, to the sum and substance that was behind there, including a few things they put in quotes, meaning that if it's in quotation marks, the words are actually in there somewhere. And what it is, it refers, it says here that um, there was, and this is, was in there, the 1 October intercept of Lee Oswald, and the fact that there was another copy of that intercept found after the assassination. Now, uh, they thought it was important that we should know that the word was intercept. Otherwise, they wouldn't have put that in there and put quotes around it. And to me, what it means is not a transcript. It means a tape. And I don't know what would be so sensitive about it. Uh, I have a theory that Peter Scott and I worked on at the time, and I remember Peter asking Jeremy this as we were having a, a drink after one of these, these, these very four one year ago. And Peter asked him directly, did the Mexicans have the copy? And Jeremy sat there very silent. The Mexicans did man the tap centers for us. And I think the, the idea, uh, if it were 
uh, widely exposed today, or at the, even at the time in 1995 when the review board was doing its work, that the Mexicans were tapping all of the embassies for the Central Intelligence Agency, and that a number of the people that had worked for us had risen to prominent positions in the Mexican government, uh, that it would have been very damaging to Mexican-American relations and, and to, to people in Mexico. And if that had happened early on, or halfway through the review board's work, um, the kinds of decisions they were able to get, favorable decisions from the president, may not have continued. They, they may have felt that the sensitivity of this, this information here uh, was such that it, it actually could threaten the, the, their ability to do what they did for us for the following three or four years. Um, obviously, I'm, I am engaging in wild, gross, irresponsible speculation, Max, but in any event, um, I'm, you know, somebody has to, so why not me? Yeah, got one more item and then I'll quit. Um, one final, one final piece of the puzzle. Uh, there weren't two calls, there were three. The calls, these imposter calls, by the way, as I said, happened after Oswald failed to get the visas. He quit. He never came back. The, uh, the Cubans and, and the Soviets were very clear about that. Uh, the first uh, imposter call happens on Saturday, and the last one is on Tuesday. Appar allegedly checking, you know, on, on visa uh, uh, matters that he had never bothered to fill out, if you actually read what the Russians say happened uh, in, inside. In any event, there was a call on Monday, and how do we know that? Because Mrs. Tarasov is the one who transcribed that call. And uh, here she is talking about it and the details of it. And, and it's a it's pretty extraordinary uh, transcript because it involved an, uh, the Oswald character offering information for money and asking for money to travel to defect yet again to the Soviet Union. In an illegal way, by the way, across Cuba. And his passport was marked, you know, valid for travel to the Soviet Union. So presumably he wanted to go, he could just go like he had done the first time. Um, anyway, she was questioned uh, again by the House Select Committee. You know, couldn't you be confusing this thing? And she, she provided the details. Uh, again, here is, um, here's where she said, no, I'm not confusing it with, uh, with the other tape, I'm certain. And, and look, you know, it came in marked urgent. <laughs> that backs up what Wynne Scott said about him being very dangerous and they were very concerned with him. And, and there is a, a remarkable harmony, I think, here of the, what the station personnel are saying they did and, and how seriously they took his visit and, and uh, what they did about it and reported it. Um, they were urgent tapes, she says. Priority, ha priority handling over the other conversations on the reel. Um, after that transcription, the translator would immediately notify their contact and turn the transcript over to him on the same day that it had been delivered. So we're, you know, can you imagine I'm erasing tapes when everything's urgent? I, I have difficulty with that idea. Um, Mr. Tarasov, um, who had participated in the, in the translation and transcription of some of these, these calls, uh, particularly the, I, think, I believe the, uh, the, the, the legitimate Duran-Kostikov call on Friday, uh, when Oswald was inside those calls. Anyway, he said, when asked how Oswald's name came into this whole thing, he said Oswald had come to the station's attention prior to this conversation, the Monday one, or what led to uh, the request to get his name. In his testimony, he said it was possible that Os Oswald first came to the station's attention through his contacts with the Cuban embassy. Um, more on Mr. Tarasov, never mind. And when Scott tells the same story in foul foe. In other words, when he describes the Monday call, it has all the same elements of it. The, 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 the exchange of information for money and, and the redefection. And so does David Phillips. David Phillips testified under oath. Uh, he's talking about the Monday call, the, the, the offer of, uh, of information for money. So you have here a, sort of a dream team, no? Everybody there remembers it. But it's not just the tape that's gone. The phone call, I mean the transcript of that tape, is also gone in this case. 
And, and I think I know why now. I, never, I didn't figure this out until a few days ago when I was looking at all this stuff again. And I could be wrong about this, but surely, because if you, and when you look at the details of that uh, transcript, the missing transcript, because it contains Oswald's name and links him to the Cuban consulate, it's got to go away. Or the cover story about we didn't know he was in the Cuban consulate will not stand. So you can have the Saturday call and say we didn't know about it until after the assassination. You can have the Tuesday call because it doesn't mention the Cuban consulate. But if you let that transcript stay in there, guess what? That part of the cover story won't hold. Um, we see, I think here, in, in these cover stories and, and, and how the lone assassin idea was, was put together so quickly, diverse motives from sources and methods to covering up incompetence and negligence and even preventing World War III. On the dark side, however, it appears, and I think one can make the argument credibly, that it would have permitted conspirators to avoid the scrutiny of investigation. That what happened in Mexico City was that the basis for the creation of the lone assassin story began and was used by the president six weeks later. So while you have agencies uh, creating lies that cover up the evidence of their colossal failures, and the president's using, uh, panicking, I would say, the chief justice and other senior leaders, the real perpetrators walk away scot-free. Anyway, I would think that uh, there are some big teaching points besides whose theory is right and whose theory is wrong about the case cover stories told by the government, while they may achieve objectives in the short run, always do irreparable damage to the public confidence when they come out, and they do inevitably. Secondly, I, I think um, the kind of thing uh, that the review board's done, and, and, I, and I think we were all impressed with, with Judge Thunheim's presentation, is the first step in repairing that damaged confidence. And one last observation, as we sat here yesterday afternoon, you know, and, and uh, watching Cyril, who play, who's, you know, really was the pessimist and others were the optimist, uh, you know, I think we need to be patient. Six million pieces of paper is a lot, and we need to take our time, and we need a lot of people to analyze and read and interpret. My sense of this conference, though, is that in many areas we're moving forward. So I've seen some really good presentations and analyses, and, and I think uh, with, uh, you know, uh, more stubby pencils and, and, and elbow grease, we'll, we'll get there maybe one day. Thank you very much.